Hello and welcome to Resolve, an after-play show. This is an after-show for a role-playing game that does not have an actual play, where we tell you all the details of our game so you don't have to listen to it. Hi, I'm Sammy, and I'll be your host. My pronouns are she, her, and joining me today is my wonderful co-host, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. My pronouns are he, him. And for this special character introduction, we are joined by Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn, pronouns she, her, and I am playing Pony with an I, pronouns also she, her, a Falabella horse who believes she is a unicorn. So before we get into Pony and what your, your ideas and goals for her are all about. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and your history with tabletop games in general? So, Alex, you were actually my first ever DM. I got into uh, tabletops when I started college. My first semester, we did one of the Pokemon tabletop campaigns, and that was really fun because I'd only ever like played the Pokemon video game and card game, so I think that was a good intro. And after that, the ball just kept on rolling. Let me pause you there, because any time I bring up this game, I have to talk about uh, how in this game, Pokemon can die if you do enough damage to them. And this was like a social media forward game. So what I always talk about when I bring up this game is live on camera when they were doing a sort of challenge, I guess not live, but recorded, your character had a Charmander completely burn up an Oddish. That is correct. And that footage followed you throughout the entire campaign uh, because like later into it, like the first episode of your show was starting to air. Yeah, I believe I got some backlash for that. I don't regret it though, because it was funny at the time. It was funny and I got to use it as a, as a bludgeon, which was great. Anyway, I'm sure you did more roleplay after that. Yes. Um, then we did a D&D campaign that... Was it Zach who DM'd that? It was either you or Zach, Alex. I think it was Zach or either other Alex, because I didn't play. Yeah, I think Zach ran a game. It was Zach. Yeah, Zach ran the game that I was in, so I think you were in that one, too. Yes, because it was like you and me and Michael and... God, this was so long ago. It's going on a decade. I'm so old. But yeah, I've had several other Pokemon tabletop RPGs, about one a year. I had one other D&D campaign. I've had two vampire campaigns, one that was what an intro that made me read the rule book, and one that was really, really good that we got to finish. So I was happy about that. Yes, we were, we were very happy with that game, Sammy. You should be beaming. Yay, good, I'm glad. So you've played a lot of different games, different tabletop modes and genres. What drew you to playing, to begin playing in the first place? Well, it really was just a way to hang out with friends. So with the Pokemon tabletop RPG, it was held, I think at least one session was held at Poketech, and then there were others that were held after Poketech, which was the Pokemon Club at Virginia Tech that I was in my entire college career. And, you know, everything in my life kind of starts with Pokemon, or is at least Pokemon adjacent, really. It's all about, like, catching those little mans. But it was just an extension of, oh, okay, I like to play these video games. Why not these tabletop games? And then it was so fun playing, like, with people and just having that connection. There's something so satisfactory about sitting around a table with a lot of people you like and other people you want to get to know and just like hang out for a while even if the session sucks at least you're hanging out with friends so this is also the first time you're playing anything in the uh, powered by the apocalypse engine or interstitial specifically right i think so i've done pokemon tabletop D D, and vampire the masquerade is there anything that like sticks out to you as interesting and different about the system being like centered around those 2d6 rolls? Yeah, like so in Vampire, like the more powerful you get, the more dice you get, but in Interstitial it doesn't seem to be working out that way. There was also the whole like picking your character 
type going forward into that. I picked Knucklehead for Pony, so I kind of made my character first and then went back into the rule book to try to figure out, like, okay, how would she fit in? We'll talk a bit more about Pony's exact moves and everything in the second, but before we, we dive into Pony real tight, what is your relationship to everyone else in the table? Most of you guys are my college friends. I met Alex and Zach first semester at Virginia Tech. Then I got to meet Sammy the year after that. Then I got to meet Dan. And then so I had the vampire session that Sammy was DMing. And then I had Alex and then Dan was in the other campaign. But it was fun to hear about what was going on on the other side. Then through you guys, I got to meet Dan Dex. All right. Are there any fun facts about you you want to share before we wrap up and start talking about Pony? I am in a competitive Pokemon League where I do battle against anywhere from 15 to 23 other people, depending on the season. I don't always win, but I do participate, and that's half the battle. Is this the Draft League? It is the Draft League, yes. What's in your current party right now? Right now, I'm. it's like in between sessions, and it started when I was moving, so I'm not in it at the moment. I'm waiting till the next full season to go in. But in my favorite season, I had a Charizard, I had Mudsdale, I had Zebstrika, I had Keldeo, I had Rapidash. This was before Galar. Yes, I had all four horses on my team at one point before they added two more. Looks like we have a good idea about all of your influences going into Pony. So why don't we talk about her? Who is Pony? Pony is a Falabella Pony, which is the smallest breed of horse. They're meant to pull tiny little carts and just be like fancy pets for rich people. She has bay coloring, which is her body is a medium brown and then her mane and tail are black. And then she has full sock markings, which means her hooves up to her knees are black. And then on her forehead, she has one white dot called a star. She's also six hands high, which is about 30 inches. She's less rideable, more cute to look at. Was there any particular reason you selected that breed of horse? I thought it would be funny that to like play something with a Napoleonic complex because she's very in your face. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to act first and think later. But she is so small. She could literally be scooped up by a regular human. Well, speaking of that Napoleon complex, where does Pony come from? What are some influences on Pony? So do you mean like how I thought of Pony or like where she comes from in her backstory? In her backstory, uh, but also what are some media influences? Okay, so that kind of like ties into the same thing because Pony is from the Shrek universe. She's one of the several talking animals that has been seen. She's kind of like Donkey, but she's never met Donkey. I didn't want to like cross the timelines or anything like that. So Pony began her life on a breeding farm for these fancy little ponies to be used as pets for the nobles in Lord Farquaad's court. And she was the only horse there that had the ability to speak. How did the people in Pony's life react to that? Well, the lowly stable hands who first heard her speak were incredulous. One of them thought she was a monster. The other ones thought she was pretty cool. But the human that had the influence over her, the barn owner, Baron Calvin Igula, he was a baron. He did not care about how Pony was a living sentient being. He heard her speak and saw dollar signs. So he was like, oh my gosh, I can sell her for even more money because she can do this trick. So then she was sold to 
T.P. Bailey's Amazing Circus, where she was a sideshow act for quite a while. She did mostly a little bit of stand-up comedy, also some, like, jumping through hoops, literally, a little dog and pony show. And she did that for a while. She hated it, but she didn't really know where else to go. But then Lord Farquhar started rounding up all of the magical creatures so he could put them in Shrek's swamp. And Pony was like, absolutely not. I'm not going into a swamp. So she escaped the circus and fled into the woods. So she's just been wandering around the woods for quite a time. So to answer like why I chose a tiny little horse in the Shrek universe, I always loved playing funny characters And I kind of wanted to do one that had a more transparent, tragic backstory. I thought it would be fun to contrast like the comedy of this tiny little creature just headbutting people and kicking people just to get her way um, with the fact that she grew up to be so lonely and she was sentient, but she was treated like property and she doesn't really trust human beings and therefore a lot of other sentient creatures and also she feels like she has lost something and she's trying so hard to regain it but it's something she never had in the first place so pony being the only horse on the farm that could speak she got it into her head that she must be a unicorn because that's the only other speaking equine she has ever heard of Like she heard the stable hands um, speaking in hushed tones. Hey, did you hear that rumor that a unicorn passed by recently? Yeah, someone spoke to it and it cheated them out of three gold coins. Stuff like that. So even though that is the flimsiest of evidence, Pony believes it with all of her heart. So her main goal in life is to get back her unicorn powers. She thinks the white star on her head was her unicorn horn that was taken off. It's not. It's just a very common horse marking. And before the events of this campaign, she is just aimlessly wandering around the woods trying to find a unicorn and or magical objects and or magical people to give her some information. She's a little lost because her act first was to break out of the circus So we know that what's special about Pony in this world is that she has a voice. What does that voice sound like? Can you say something for us as Pony? Sure. I'm not really, like, good at doing character voices, but Pony is definitely, like, a little gruffer, a little deeper than my natural timber. She's something like, hi, I'm Pony. I am a unicorn. Don't let the lack of horn fool you. So like a little more deep and a little more forceful than my regular voice, if that's coming across. You've mentioned that Pony's had some difficulty in trusting people around her, mostly because, you know, she's been traded and used as a trick, uh, you know, animal show fodder and everything like that. What do you think Pony's impression of the people around her is? She is extremely wary of all humanoids. That kind of includes Tau, even though Tau is a hologram. She's very impressed with Asiri because Asiri is not very humanoid, but she's huge and can do magic. It's going to take a while for her to really warm up to uh, people. How about our other player characters? How do you think the pony is going to view them starting off here? A lot of the other player characters have like magical abilities or some kind of fantastical abilities, right? She is going to be insanely jealous, but she's going to try to not show it. Like, for example, if she sees like Geyser pull out some handkerchiefs or do some kind of sleight of hand magic, she will try her hardest not to look impressed. But inside, she's just going to be burning with jealousy like damn, this clown has magical abilities and I don't have any? I have to rectify this. So Athanos, he kind of looks like a human Greek god, but huge, right? That's too humanoid for her. She's going to have to distrust him and just like not show any 
signs of her being impressed at his magic. How about our characters? How about Asiri and Smog? Asiri, she's very impressed by because she's less humanoid and has shown an ability to do magic. Smog, what does Smog look like again? He's humanoid-ish, right? Or... So Smog is a Moogle, and he looks very, like, bipedal, rabbit-like, but also has this little antenna that ends in a furry ball called a palm, and he has uh, little leathery purple bat wings. And he wears a PVC jacket, looks kind of like a leather uh, biker jacket. Being bipedal is a strike against him. Only true (laughs) quadrupedals will understand but he is less humanoid, so she is more likely to trust him. But would she would she let Smog ride on her back? No, because he would crush her. Maybe if he got shrunken down to be like a little smaller, it could work out. Obviously, your your character had relationships before they were taken into the game world. Who are some of those NPCs that you have starting links with? All I really have is a dark link with the farm owner and horse breeder, Baron Calvin Igula, and the dark link with the circus master, T.P. Bailey. She really lived a very lonely existence. Because she could speak human, she was unable to communicate with horses, so she doesn't have any like relationship with horses, so she didn't grow up normal as a horse or as like a sentient person and then whenever she tried to talk to the stable hands they wouldn't have a conversation with her they would just be like oh cool horse maybe feed her a treat but that doesn't erase the pain of loneliness we know a little bit about pony's idea that she is a unicorn but what does she think that entails what does she think has been stolen from her? What does she think unicorns should be able to do? So she has never seen a unicorn in person, but according to the classic fairy tales about unicorns, because they're a symbol of purity and grace and all that, they can do things like clear up murky water and even poison water. They can refresh vegetation so they can make plants grow. Sometimes the more powerful unicorns, whenever they walk, they have flowers springing up into their footsteps. She's heard rumors of unicorns being able to levitate and talk to people, like do a little bit of telepathy using their horns, but she hasn't been able to confirm that. That hasn't been as prominently in the rumor mill as the whole unicorns are purity embodied myths. So I don't think there's a ton of unicorns in the Shrek universe, at least my memory. Is there any other sort of media you're using as an inspiration for what Pony thinks a unicorn should be? A little bit of the Peter S. Beagle, the last unicorn, a little bit of like My Little Pony just to like use the horn as the kind of the telepathic source because Pony doesn't have hands or thumbs or anything like that. That would be something a horse could use instead of like hoofing everything. What do you think might happen if Pony ever encountered an actual unicorn? The unicorn would ridicule Pony for thinking that she was one of them. Pony would be like, oh my gosh, you're my hero. But the unicorn probably wouldn't look twice at her. Unless it was a very kind unicorn. Like, you know how some celebrities, like, every time their fans ask for a selfie, they're really rude, but then some are really nice? It's going to be more of that dynamic. And what do you think might happen if, for whatever reason, Pony somehow acquires some sort of magical ability? She's going to be a little bit of an egomaniac about it and start using her powers, like, whenever she can. And she's really going to hype up her powers, too. Like, if, for example, she can dissolve, like, the poison in a cup of wine so one of her friends doesn't get poisoned, she's like, oh my gosh, Give me the whole barrel. I can purify it all when really she doesn't have the strength for that. She's not a liar, but she is prone to bragging and exaggeration. So as far as mechanics and power, 
Where is Pony now? What playbook does she have? What moves are you starting with? Oh, she is a knucklehead through and through. I picked three abilities. Let me... I picked You're Too Slow. I picked Gear Second. And I picked Let's Go Back Together. And why did you select those? Well, it was a little process of elimination. So the knucklehead has a couple moves that I just don't think that Pony would really do. There's one that's Dance, Water, Dance, where you focus your energy inward and create clones of yourself. Her whole thing is that she doesn't have any real magical powers. She can only talk. And even then, sometimes not very well. Sometimes her grammar is off because she learned to speak by listening to really rough and tough stable hands. So that one was out. Also, the art of summoning. But I liked You're Too Slow because it's about when someone looks down on you. You have to, like, you get bonus points when someone looks down on you. And I think not just, like, metaphorically, like, oh, you're a weak little pony. You're not worth my time. But also physically, because she's so small, like, most people will physically look down on her. And I picked Gear Second just to speed things up a little bit whenever she's in a real pinch because her legs are just so, so tiny. Like she can run at a full gallop and it's not going to move very fast still. Gear Second allows you to use two moves back to back, right? Yes. Is that at the cost of something? Either move fails, you take harm and are left wide open, needing to regain your strength. So yeah, that is Pony's style. She rushes in head first and doesn't really have a strategy. And then the last one was let's go back together, which is when things are at their worst, roll to limit break. And instead of a forward, you may choose to roll with an advantage. And if you roll plus 12, everyone in the party gets the bonus. That's kind of like her being the cheerleader. She's like, everyone, don't give up. We can do this. I know I can do this. So you guys are always going to do it too. Because if nothing else, Pony always has unwavering faith in her ability to get through harsh situations. It sounds like Pony's been through a lot of harsh situations. Where does Pony draw power from in that moment where maybe they do waver in strength a little bit, or maybe they do feel like they're too small or inadequate for their task? What motivates her to keep going? She thinks back to her circus days where she was forced. Do you know what horse diving is? It's when you get a horse up on a huge diving board, like you would a human, and there is a pool of water at the bottom. And it's literally like a human diving off the diving board, but it's a horse. And sometimes they have rings where you have to go through the rings before you can get to the pool. And Mr. T.P. Bailey, the ringleader of the circus, he told Pony, if you don't do this, I'm selling you to the glue factory because otherwise you're not worth anything as a sideshow. No one likes a sideshow pony who can't do anything. And she was so scared to get up on that diving board, but she was able to dive. And yes, it was under threat of literal death. But she figured, oh, my God. I cheated death. I can do anything I want to do. That's a very powerful place to draw from once you realize you can push past any boundaries. But at the same time, you've said that this is a character very much motivated by tragedy and maybe not quite suffering, but at least a hard time at least. Has there been any more positive influences in Pony's life? She really leans hard on those unicorn fairy tales, that really like helps her get through a lot where it's like, okay, I heard this thing. So if it's real for them, it's real for me. But also she really does enjoy the simple life. She loved grazing out in the field. She loves sneaking treats from the stable hands. And while she's wandering around in the forest, vaguely looking for anything magic related. She's also kind of enjoying herself, not having to jump through hoops or off diving boards or anything. Just thinking about treats and wandering around the woods. What is Pony's favorite food? What does she chowing on? 
any kind of apple, any flavor, any variety, any size, any shape. The red ones are the crunchiest, but the green ones have the nice sour kick. She's kind of like Ryuk from Death Note, where she will just go ham on any apple she sees. You can persuade her to do something with some apples. That's interesting you mentioned Ryuk, because we were talking about the playbook a little bit. Knucklehead is very, like, shonen anime protagonist inspired. But I think that Ryuk is the knucklehead of, of that. And you found an interesting way to, to make a knucklehead here that's not quite that trope. Is there anything you're looking forward to in the campaign, either developing Pony or hoping Pony experiences? What, what kind of goals do you have for them? I want Pony to realize that she is doing just fine without any magical powers. I feel like there's going to be a point where she realizes she's not really a unicorn and she never had any powers beyond speech. And she might not be able to like get powers through any magical means but i want her to realize like oh i kicked this guy's ass and i climbed in this mountain and i took down these enemies without any magic powers so i'm perfect as is it's really like a way for me to explore self-acceptance like okay i maybe i didn't like achieve all of my life goals but I did also achieve this stuff so maybe I don't need like these other things that society and my mom tell me I need what do you think could get Pony there because she's so embedded in this fantasy that she is a unicorn what could prove to her otherwise there could be meeting a unicorn and having them laugh at her because she's not a unicorn and it's funny to them that she thinks it's a unicorn It could be like she encounters a magical object that tells her she also does not have any magical abilities. It could be training with a mentor and then having the training go nowhere because there's like no magic to draw out of her. So the training is kind of moot. I I think everyone who sits down at an RP table or does any sort of character slash creative writing does this but what what parts of yourself are in pony well one the love of horses that's pretty um obvious but deeper down there's the whole like needing to be better than they really are it's like okay i'm okay like this but what if i train myself and i get this this and this ability and then i'll be complete like sometimes i think to myself okay what if i was able to pass portfolio and get into studio and do graphic design what if I could like get a better job and like do like do more interior design or stuff like that but then I realized oh my life is actually pretty good as is and I could be much much worse off it's just like the whole I was like forced to be very competitive in school up to 12th grade. It was like, get into college, get into college, GPA, extracurriculars. And now that I'm kind of past that point, it's like, oh shit, what else do I do with my life? And I think Pony's going to have to have that moment for herself where she realizes, oh, I'm not super amazing, but that's still okay. What was Pony doing right before the start of the game? Right before the start of the game, she was just kind of wandering aimlessly through the Shrek woods, like the same woods where Shrek Swamp is, but like way on the other side. She was just kind of in a transitional period because she had just escaped the circus. And she, again, she acted first and thought second. She knew she didn't want to be rounded up with Lord Farquaad's goons, so she escaped into the woods. But now it's like, okay, all right, I've escaped. What now? So she's just kind of moseying along, looking out for magical objects. What is one tidbit or fact about Pony that you haven't told anybody yet? She loves to get scratched behind her withers. Like, you know how you scratch a dog behind its ears and it just like kind of melts? If someone does the same thing to that behind her withers, behind her like little shoulder blades, She will love it so much. Awesome. So it sounds like 
sounds like we have a good idea about who Pony is. So let's hop into our resolution phase where Carolyn, you get to say one thing about Pony and we don't get to comment on it. I think Pony deserves to have magical unicorn abilities, even if she doesn't need them. So I'm very curious as to see like if she's able to be successful and get magical ab abilities or if she has to reckon with just being amazing as she is. This has been Resolve, an after play show. You can find us online at most social media sites at Resolve AP. Except Instagram, which is at Resolve After Play. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. You can buy the game we're playing, Interstitial, our hearts intertwined from its creator, Riley Hopkins, at linksmithgames.com. All links will be in the description of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. We end our turn here. So now it's your turn. Tell us about a character you're making for your game.